Good morning. Beautiful day to gather to worship. I trust you enjoyed your drive even to church, perhaps a quiet moment getting ready. I know some of you even here come in and just take a moment to gather your thoughts or to look at the word. Uh, ours is the privilege of worship this morning. Let me uh, give you just a few uh, announcements regarding life in the body here on Friday night at seven o'clock. If you're able to join us, we'll gather for an hour of worship on Good Friday, a uh, special season of remembrance. Then the following day on Saturday, two events. One is a baby shower at two o'clock uh, for Savannah and baby girl Toe. And that will be out at Dan and Catherine Moorhead's farm. And you can check the email for the address there. And then uh, also that evening, from 6 to 8.30, uh, the youth group will gather for our Bible study together. So a couple of things going on this week. And then uh, also, thank you for praying for Holly Schmidt's mother. Is there an update there, Holly, you could give us? Okay, well, we praise the Lord for that. And uh, it's been a long year for uh, Holly's mom and the family, so continue to pray for her as she recovers uh, from this little bout that she had. Uh, and then bear one another up in prayer. Uh, from time to time, I was reminded of this week, somebody will ask me, hey, do you know how so-and-so is doing? Well, sometimes I do and sometimes I don't, but in both cases, I rarely feel like answering the question because I would rather steer you to reach out to them. As the Lord put that on your heart, uh, exercise that muscle of the one another's and uh, reach out. Uh, what's the worst that'll happen? Well, you might catch them at a bad time, but generally most of us know what it is to, to have somebody ask about us and we feel cared for. So please don't hesitate to do that. Uh, by the Spirit, you are completely ready to minister to one another in that way. Uh, let me just give you one other announcement. Um, in in this different times when I order books, um, my book company has been sending me a sample of the first three chapters of a book called Providence by Pastor John Piper. Uh, if you'd like to wet your whistle uh, on a study of Providence, which he defines as intentional sovereignty, then uh, grab one of those and take a look at it. After reading the first three chapters, I went ahead and committed to reading the 700-page book. Uh, that is a stack of about 10 of those right there. But if you want one of those, grab those. I'll put them up on the front row here. Um, again, just a sample of the first few chapters. But in light of so much that goes on in our chaotic world and even our chaotic lives, there is a great comfort in the scriptures that comes from the reality of our God being in the heavens and doing whatever he pleases. All right, let's turn our attention to worship here this morning. And I want us to hear from a familiar psalm, Psalm 118, that in the, the season of the year that we're celebrating historically as a time when Christ was announcing his kingship and riding into Jerusalem, uh, the great cry of the people was, Hosanna. Uh, which we would interpret as, save us, Lord. And that comes from Psalm 118, beginning in verse 25. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has made his light to shine upon us. You are my God and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, and I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let's pray together as we praise this God. Oh Lord, we do praise you this morning as the God of salvation. By your grace, we called out, save us, Lord. And in your mercy, and in your love, you did. We praise you this morning for bringing us out of darkness and into your marvelous light. We praise you for your goodness, for every good gift that comes down from above from you, our Heavenly Father. And we praise you for your love. You're never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always 
and forever love. Most clearly demonstrated to us through Jesus, by whose name we praise you even today. Amen. Let's raise our voices in praise to the Lord as we stand and sing. This morning comes from Matthew chapter 21. 
first 11 verses. <clears throat> Matthew 21. <clears throat> now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, this morning we are thankful for our Savior, that he is the Son of God. And we join the voices of the crowds in shouting Hosanna to the son of David, Hosanna in the highest. But we come also in confession this morning that often our eyes turn from him. With, when, when one, in one minute we are saying Hosanna, and in the next minute we are doubting. We are discontent. We're envious of what others have. In many ways, we find ourselves turning our eyes from you to ourselves. So Lord, we confess that to you. We're thankful that you are a God who is quick to forgive, that in Christ there is abundance of mercy because of his death for us. So Lord, we pray this morning, if we have any sin in our heart, we would confess it to you now we would come before you with clean hearts, with pure hearts, that we can worship you truly in spirit and in truth. May Christ be exalted in all that's done this morning, for we pray in his name. Amen. Here from Galatians 3, 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who was hanged on a tree. This is the power of the cross, that Christ became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Let's stand together as we sing the power of the cross.
our affirmation of faith. This morning we'll continue through our Psalm 119 journey. So we'll pick it up in verse 81 and go through 88. My soul longs for your salvation. I hope in your word. For I have become like a wineskin in the smoke, yet I have not forgotten your statutes. How long must your servant endure? When will you judge those who persecute me? The arrogant have dug pitfalls for me. They do not live according to your law. They have almost made an end of me on earth, but I have not forsaken your precepts. In your steadfast love, give me life, that I may keep the testimonies of your mouth. May that be true of us this morning. And so let's take our petitions to this great God that we praise, who sustains us through all things. Let him hear your heart this morning. Father, it's with praise and thanksgiving that we come to you, that we can lay petitions before you. We can ask you for what we need and also for what we want, that you've been gracious to hear our petitions and our desires. And this morning, in turning our hearts towards the things that please you, we ask that righteousness would abound in this nation again. We ask that evil be defeated in the hearts of men, as well as in time and space, in our homes, in our places of commerce. Lord, in this body and other churches around this city, this nation, and indeed the world, as judgment, you said, begins at the house of the Lord, I pray that you'll judge us gently, correcting us kindly, massaging us back onto the path as we need it. We pray this morning that your righteousness will abound in every corner of this world. We seek the day, may it be even today, that you would be on everybody's hearts and minds, on their lips, and that that day would arrive when we would no more have to say to our neighbors, know the Lord, because you will be in each and every one of us. Lord, I pray that you'll save the wicked, for we too were once wicked, made righteous, declared righteous, only by the blood of Jesus. Only able to be seen in your sight as righteous in spite of our wickedness, and Lord, we pray that it would be true in every corner of our nation in this world. Make us more and more into the image of Jesus. Transform every part of every kingdom of this world into the kingdom of our Lord. Don't withhold your spirit from any. I pray that you'll pour it out in such a way that those who resist will no longer be able to. Breathe life where it doesn't exist. Bring forth the dead, even as the death of your son resulted in the resurrection of many in Jerusalem. May it again be true, bring forth from the dead those that need your life. We pray that you would save those whom we love and those that we have disdain for. I pray that those who hate you will come to love you, that you'll bring even our politicians, our representatives, and those who seek power for nothing more than wicked gain, that they will be turned into those who serve and worship Jesus. We pray especially for President Biden, Vice President Harris, those in the cabinet, governors all over this country, for city officials and county officials, those who live spiteful lives against you and against your word, those who hate you as the great I am, 
and spitefully flaunt a wicked lifestyle in front of you. Those who would promote and wish for and laud the killing of innocent children in the womb of their mothers. Those who would put to death the elderly that they see as having no value any longer. Lord, those who live in homosexual lifestyles and hate your word and do everything they can to twist it into something it doesn't say, I pray that you'll draw each of them into your kingdom and give them hearts of flesh. Change their hearts of stone so that they too will worship Jesus. We pray, Lord, that as many have gone out at your calling to do a full-time vocational service for you, many pastors, many missionaries, Bible translators we've recently come to know, Lord, would you be with the many of them that may be discouraged, remind them that your kingdom is without end, and it ultimately will triumph. May it even be today. Lord, would you continue to make the way for the farmers, for the Webbers, for the Schroders? Would you show them what you've called them to, help them to see it clearly, and then to be able to function well with all that you've given them? Grant them the tools that they need, help them to know exactly what to do with them, and then bless that ministry. Lord, we ask you for so many things, but ultimately may it come down to what glorifies Jesus. We know that he is glorified both in the saving of the lost and ultimately in the judgment of the wicked. I pray that you will be pleased to save more and judge fewer these days. We ask you that your kingdom would expand and overwhelm hell. May your kingdom be without end. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Christ is our only hope in this world. Let's stand as we sing, All I Have is Christ.
We've come to the conclusion of our letter to the church in Ephesus. Paul, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writing to Timothy, and by the doctrine of God's preservation of his word uh, to us as well. Stick to the truth. That's been Paul's message to Timothy. It's been our study for the last 19 weeks or so. Last week, we considered a postscript. It was as if the letter came to a conclusion with the great doxology to the God who is immortal and invisible, the God who reigns and his dominion is forever. And then the postscript, as if Paul wanted to give one more instruction to those who were rich in the world. Not because they were in sin for being rich, but because of the dangers that lurk for those who are rich. So he warned them of dangers and called them to a duty of generosity. And then we have what would be called in formal English a PPS, a post postscript. Now some would argue from English it would be PSS, a post superscript, but generally we are in an the second after. There was the script, there was the after script, and now we are in the after after script. These last two verses where Paul just can't get away from this theme. And we see it here in verses 20 and 21 this morning as our text. O oh, Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. For by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. Grace be with you. One final reminder of the theme of the letter to the church. Stick to the truth. And it comes with some passion as we see that interjection there. Oh, Timothy. There's this last kind of burst of energy, this of passion from Paul as he wants to make sure Timothy hears it one more time. Oh, Timothy, stick to the truth. Oh, Ephesus, stick to the truth. Elders here, stick to the truth. Oh, Grace Bible Church, stick to the truth. God's truth is the foundation of our faith. We've seen it all through the letter. God's truth is the fuel for godliness, our believing in Jesus and our becoming like him. God's truth is the power to renew our minds, to bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. God's truth is the promise that gives us the hope of eternal life. So stick to the truth. God's truth will shape your habits and your character that will be evident this week in your choices and your responses. God's truth is that which will bolster your marriage with whatever weaknesses there may be. God's truth will guide your parenting through those toddler years and on into the teen years and beyond. It's God's truth that will shape your work ethic as the alarm goes off early this week and you dive back into the routine. God's truth will steer your politics through the ever volatile discussions of them. God's truth will govern your desires. It'll anchor our church. Oh, Timothy, oh, pastor, oh, church, stick to the truth. I wanna show you three responses that you should have to this inspired conclusion to the letter of First Timothy. Number one, treasure the truth. If you're going to stick to the truth, it would sure help if you saw some value in it. Paul tells Timothy to guard the deposit entrusted to you. So guard, watch over, keep your eye on it, keep it secure. And then just one Greek word, this deposit entrusted to you, this thing you've received, 
this heirloom that's been handed down. Guard it. You've been entrusted with something valuable, and the command is don't lose it. Some of you might have a safe at home, perhaps a, a firebox buried in the closet somewhere or under the bed. Maybe you have a safety deposit box at a bank where you keep some valuables, a, a gold watch from a grandfather, important papers, documents. Maybe some of you still stuff money and treasures in your mattress. The point is we all understand what it is to have something of value that we want to keep safe. Some of you lock your cars. Some of you figure if it gets stolen, they're only doing me a favor. You lock your house. You grab your kid's hand in a busy parking lot. Why? We do all those things to guard what is valuable to us. Paul is telling Timothy, you've received something valuable, and this whole letter has steered Timothy and the church back to what sounds stuffy, but to doctrine. And doctrine does matter. In an age and a culture when the church is being told over and over again that doctrine divides, it's love that will unite, that would be a contradiction like we would see Paul warning Timothy about in the next verse. No, doctrine is our only great hope of true unity. It's the doctrine, the revelation of God that reveals to us what love really is. So treasure this truth that you've been entrusted with. Many of you are too young to even remember the investment of truth in your life. You've just grown up with a golden spoon, a silver spoon in your mouth. You've always had the truth. Others of you know what it is to live a life of great sinfulness, great lostness, having embraced even false religion. And then you were entrusted with the truth. In either case, whether you're like Timothy, who from a child has known the Holy Scriptures, or like Paul, who lived a life of self-righteousness before being arrested by grace, both are to take what they've received and treasure it because it's of great value. Treasure the truth. Guard the deposit. So the question arises, what exactly is this deposit, this treasure? Well, as we look through this letter and the rest of the New Testament, we realize this language of being entrusted with something, receiving a deposit, receiving the commandment, as we saw in earlier chapters, receiving the faith. This deposit is God's revealed truth. What has God revealed? Well, from Genesis onward, God has revealed his holy law, his standard, what he expects in obedience and worship from his creation. And we must keep that law or be punished eternally. Well, by Genesis 3, humanity has chosen to disobey God's law and has set all of mankind on a trajectory of death and then certain judgment. Because of the sin of our representative Adam in the garden, all men have become sinners and thus are all under the sentence of death. You could read that, that logical progression in the narrative of Genesis 3 or in the doctrine of Romans chapter 5. So what then? If the Bible ends at Genesis 3, then all men are trapped in their unbelief under the sentence of death and will be judged. End of story. But as you know, that's not the end of the story. Because as God reveals his law, that law reveals our sin. It shows us that we, like Adam and Eve in the garden, are law breakers. We don't want to yield to the lordship of God. We don't want his laws. We want to do our own thing. But our law breaking has made us guilty before God, this holy God, this righteous judge. But there in Genesis 3, in the proto-evangel, the first 
hint of the gospel. We hear that the seed of the woman would one day come to crush the serpent's head, to deal with this sin mess, to fix this enmity, this conflict between God and his creation. Romans 8 would tell us that all creation still groans under this curse, longing for redemption. And so is the promise of God that a Savior would come. And as the Old Testament unfolds, we see that that Savior is also called a son. A son would be born. A son of a virgin, yes, but also the Son of God. And this son would be the Messiah, the chosen one, the anointed one, or as the New Testament calls it, the Christ. So God reveals his law, which reveals our sin, and then God in his mercy reveals a savior. Jesus, who kept the law from his childhood through his adulthood, kept all of God's law perfectly, something none of us have ever done. Jesus paid sin's penalty of death. Peter says the just died for the unjust. And then Jesus conquered death by rising from the dead. And certainly we're aware of that historic event that comes in this season of the year. The tomb was empty. You've read the text. Jesus did all this so that whoever repents of their sin and believes in him receives that record of perfect righteousness that he accomplished for us. They receive the forgiveness of sins that Jesus died to accomplish, and they receive everlasting life, which Jesus won for them by rising from the dead. All of this and all of the doctrine that, that emits outward from it and all of our understanding from the scriptures, this is all the deposit entrusted to the church. This is the truth that we fight for, Jude says. We contend for the faith, the faith that is unique from every other religion of the world, which says that you have to do something to be good enough. Where our faith is this, Jesus has done it. Jesus has kept the law. Jesus died for sin. Jesus conquered death. And all we do is by faith latch on to Jesus and we have eternal life. This is the faith we must fight for. And we should know this because every one of us, no matter how long we've believed this truth, still, still have this craving to be righteous on our own. And this is true, and we know it's true, because we love pats on the back. We love to be seen as good, as moral, as, as the ones who are right, as the ones with good doctrine. There's something that swells up within us. It's that pride that forgets we were once wretches that have been saved by amazing grace. Treasure the truth. So perhaps next Sunday, we can eliminate a little bit of the, the rush or the to-do about how we're going to look, and we can just get up and, and enjoy a little bit, just for a few moments or with a few thoughts, the truth that we have been gifted with a treasure of truth, to be able to believe in the resurrected Christ. And on a Sunday long ago, Jesus fulfilled the prophecies of the prophet Zechariah. And he rode that donkey into Jerusalem, announcing to all in no uncertain terms that he was the king of righteousness, that he was the king of salvation, the king of peace, whose dominion, as we heard in our prayer this morning, would be to the ends of the earth. Zechariah 9, 9 and 10. Jesus was announcing the truth. It's as if he was throwing out the treasure, like somebody in a parade throwing candy to the crowd. Jesus rides into Jerusalem with truth. 
that was going to spread from the Jewish people that he came to, even though they rejected him, and now was going to go to the whole world. The treasure of truth that we've received, this story of God's glory and the salvation of sinners. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 11, Paul writes of sound doctrine that is in, in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. So Paul begins the letter saying to Timothy, I've been entrusted with the gospel. In our text, he's now saying, Timothy, this gospel has been entrusted to you. That's going to be echoed in 2 Timothy 1, 14, by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. Guard the good deposit entrusted to you. Paul received it and passes it to Timothy. He tells Timothy, guard this deposit. And then what does he tell Timothy by chapter 2 of 2 Timothy? That which you've received, the faith, the same commit to other faithful men who can do likewise. Just like that gold watch or that rocking chair or that framed art, some, some family heirloom that's been passed through the generations, so it is with our faith. This gospel of a righteous, a crucified, and then a risen Lord, we guard this faith and we pass it on. So in what way will this great reality which defines Christianity, that Christ rose from the dead, in what way will that influence your family this week? I don't care if you want to roll around an Easter egg in your yard or dye them or eat them or do whatever. All that stuff's just kind of fluffy stuff that's family activity, whatever. But will you this week in some way communicate, will you pass on what's been entrusted to you? Will you pass it on to others that the resurrected Christ means something to us? That there's some kind of power in that resurrection that is supposed to be working in us. So tell your kids to be good, but maybe remind them of where that power comes from. And try to give a soft answer that turns away wrath, but remember where that ability comes from. It comes from the resurrected Christ. 1 Corinthians 15 tells us if Christ has not risen from the dead, then all of this stuff that we're preaching and hearing and try to live out makes us just a bunch of miserable wretches because it won't work. But if Christ is risen then all of this makes sense. Paul's admonition to Timothy is stick to the truth. And if you're going to stick to the truth, it will likely be because you recognize it as a treasure. Guard the deposit. Consider the second response to Paul's conclusion. Number two, beware of distractions. The text says avoid the babble, and the contradictions. So treasure the truth and avoid anything that distracts you from it. And these distractions can come in two ways, Paul says. They can come in the form of worldliness, called here irreverent babble. This word irreverent is interesting. It has as its root the idea of a threshold. So specifically the threshold to the Temple Mount, to the next courtyard or to the temple itself, where it became a dividing line where you're unclean so you cannot cross or you're clean and you can. The threshold divided the holy and the profane, the clean and the unclean. So irreverent, that which is not holy, it's set apart to God. And then babble, simply worthless, empty sounds. You combine these together and this idea warns us about giving so much of our time and energy to worthless, worldly topics. Now careful here, by worldly I'm not saying necessarily immoral or wicked. I'm just saying the stuff of the world. As Paul used it uh, there in verse 17, as for the rich in this present age, 
in the world as the world sees rich. That's not a problem. That's just worldly as opposed to heavenly. So beware of worthless or empty worldly topics that dominate our conversation, dominate our thinking, dominate our living, our time, our schedules. And they're just empty when all is said and done. What kind of stuff fills up your day so much that you just don't have time to give attention to God's word? I mean, how long have we been believers and how many times have we gone days and weeks without giving focused attention to the word? And I'm not talking hours of study. We're, we're looking like if you, if you did five minutes of Bible reading, count it as good. And yet how many times can we not do that because we are too busy? And I wonder if old man Paul partly because of his years of experience and hearing excuses, and partly because of his being filled with the Spirit, would hear us whine about why we didn't get to do anything in our Bible this week, and would just kind of at wit's end tell us, well, then just keep living for the irreverent babble. Go ahead and just keep worrying about politics. Fill your yard with signs. Have at it. Go ahead and keep worrying about your budget app and how much money you have. Go ahead. Irreverent, worthless, worldly concerns. Frankly, you could go and find any neighbor on your street and, and they would be just as consumed as you are, but unfortunately, it would be with the same exact stuff. Instead of wrestling with how do I impart to my children the power of the resurrection, I'm worried about how they would vote when they turn 18. As if who's the president of the United States matters one iota to the kingdom of God. There are worthless, irreverent babblings, and there is a faith that we are to contend for, and a faith that will make the difference for eternity. Paul's just telling Timothy, listen, you're going to have to realize you only have so much time and energy in a day and everything in this world will compete against the truth. So just decide. I've got to do what's most important first and whatever else I have time for, great. And the reality is if you get your heart zeroed in on the word, you might still become an incredibly active Christian in the realm of politics. And you might have a great ministry of finance. Because any of those things that I gave as illustrations aren't bad in and of themselves, but let them find their place under our greatest priority of guarding the faith that's been entrusted to us. These distractions come in the form of worldliness. And then there are distractions that come in the form of error. Paul calls them contradictions. The Greek word is one we still use in English, antithesis, an antithesis. Something was stated as the truth, and now here's something that comes up against it, a contradiction. You say it, diction, and then it's against, the contra. Something says something against that. So Paul is telling Timothy, guard the truth, the gospel, the Christian faith, and don't be distracted by those things that rise up against the doctrines that we've received. Beware of error. Beware of that which opposes God's truth. And I want you to see how these contradictions to the truth are packaged. Look at the text. The end of verse 20. Contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. Falsely called knowledge. So you're in the know if you accept what the contradiction is saying. If you're going to stand on what the Bible says about this, you're old-fashioned, you're out of date, or what's the new phrase? You'll, you'll be found on the wrong side of history. It's what we're being told. 
So the contradiction is so-called knowledge. Here's what you need to know. Here's what we've come to. Here's what we've arrived at. Here's our Tower of Babel that's getting taller and taller. Look what we've learned now. But that old stuff, the Bible, no, you don't need that. Paul says beware because even the contradiction comes not as this ugly heresy, but as this appeal to be in the enlightened crowd, to be accepted as knowledgeable. Latest knowledge of our culture is that there's no such thing as male and female. So you could, you could Google some of the angst of the radical left poured out against gender reveal parties. Like how dare somebody announce it's a boy or it's a girl. And, and to us who have by and large been immersed in the word, it sounds so bizarre, so illogical, so unscientific, so unbiblical. Because Genesis says, in the image of God, he created mankind, male and female, he created them. So under the image of God, under the heading of humanity, male and female, and every DNA cell in the body is screaming out male or female, and yet knowledge, so-called, is telling us, let's, let's not go there, let's not say it that way. Maybe that's not true. Was, what, can you think even 10 years ago, did you hear anything like this? And now see how knowledgeable it seems, how accepted, how widespread. It's just one example of knowledge falsely called that contradicts God's word, in this case, his very created order of things. We're being told you can't believe God's word if you're going to be among the enlightened ones, those who know better. But Timothy is being warned here. You can't embrace the light and find a welcome in darkness. Paul would write to the Corinthians, can, can light fellowship with darkness? Can they coexist? No. No. They can't. The light is going to push back the darkness. He told that to the church at Ephesus in the Ephesian letter, chapter 5, that we're to be light, we're to walk in the light, and that exposes the darkness. And the darkness isn't going to like you if you expose the darkness. Jesus warned us of that. If it hated him, it will hate his followers. Why? Because John 3 says, Jesus, as the light came into the world, and men loved their darkness rather than light. They hated the light. So if Jesus says in Matthew 6, you are the salt of the earth, and you are the light of the world, then just know that somewhere along the way, when you let a little bit of light shine, you're going to start feeling a little bit of hate. Sticking to the truth will mean, will mean avoiding and even offending those who are in error. We avoid the error, the distractions of error, the distractions of worldly stuff, and we suffer the hate for it. So because the distractions are many, and because the consequences are dire, you can read it there. This knowledge so-called, these distractions have caused many to swerve from the faith. Temporarily, we could pray permanently at times as is recorded in scripture. So there's much at stake at sticking to the truth. The opposite is you swerve from the truth and abandon the faith. And that was warned all the way back in chapter 1 from the very beginning. And here we see it again at the end. Stick to the truth. Because that's not always easy and because you will be distracted and you will face all kinds of competing worldly ideas 
and because you'll be hated by the world, and according to Jesus' words, may suffer at times for it, be reviled, have things falsely said about you for Christ's sake. Because of all of that, see our third response to the truth. We treasure the truth. We are warned about distractions. And number three, we rely on grace. It's such an abrupt ending. In many of the epistles, Paul will say, greetings from so-and-so, greetings from the church here, greetings. In this case, he's so caught up in the truth. Stick to the truth. Stick to the truth. Don't swerve from the truth. Grace be with you. And he sends the letter in the mail. Is this if, if, as if he forgot to be nice at the end. But his point is, you need grace for this. So much of American Christianity has not needed a lot of grace in the sense of we're kind of celebrated. Christian nation. And now we're starting to get the sense that Christianity might not be as popular as we think. And so maybe this will make a little more sense to us in our time. Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you and don't swerve from it. Here's grace to help you with that. So rely on grace. It was there in the beginning of this letter, chapter 1 and verse 2, as Paul wrote, grace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. And here it is at the end, grace be with you. Rely on grace. Remembering that God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. So even in our stand for truth, even in guarding the deposit, even in standing against the world's error, you'd better do it by grace or God's not for you. He's not applauding your stand, your persecution, uh, your, your position of truth. No, it's by grace or God resists you. We do it by grace. He gives grace to the humble. And it's interesting that when he says grace be with you, the you is plural. This conclusion seemed to be steered at Timothy. Oh, Timothy, guard the deposit. Beware of distractions. Rely on grace. But wait a minute, it's, it's for all the church. Grace be with you all. As together, you, the church at Ephesus, Stick to the truth, which means it's a collective effort. It means in your conversations after church and during the week and in response to emails and through private message and in phone calls and sitting over lunch, you're reminding each other that we stick to the truth. How does the truth shape our thinking and renew our minds? What's your trouble? Oh, that sounds rough. What does the Bible say about that? How has God spoken to that? And we remind ourselves that we are people who live out our earthly days guarding the deposit entrusted to us, seeing the value in God speaking and applying those words to our lives. Grace be with you all, Paul writes. God's grace to know the truth to believe the truth, to stick to the truth. God's grace is for all of us. So by his grace, we sing, we dismiss, we go out, and we dive into another week, knowing the distractions are there. We've been warned about them. Knowing we're supposed to treasure the truth, it's what this whole letter's been about. We're good at thinking truth. I think we're good at thinking truth against worldliness. And now let's embrace our third response, realizing that it's all of God's grace that will enable us to do this well this week, triumphantly, remembering the power that raised Christ from the dead is at work in us. Grace, alive and well, so that we can stick to the truth. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, 
Give us courage. Give us the faith. Give us the, the passion to stick to the truth. May we never be ashamed of the gospel, for it is your power for salvation to everyone who believes. And if there are some here today who are not believers, then in this quiet moment, in your mercy and by your spirit, would you call them to repentance and to faith in Jesus who saves sinners? We pray these things so that you, Father, would be glorified in your church, purchased by the blood of Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing to ourselves this benediction that we go in grace alone.